The Standard Deviations podcast is a weekly production that looks at money, mind, and meaning, all through a psychological lens. Each week, psychologist and New York Times bestselling author Dr. Daniel Crosby interviews a fascinating new guest, experts in everything from finance to literature to wellness. When was the last time you splurged on something when you knew it probably conflicted with one of your financial goals, like paying down debt or saving for future fun in retirement? Well, if you do this, you're not alone. It's because of present bias, or to use the psychobabble term, hyperbolic discounting. As humans, we have a tendency to let the immediate rewards of the here and now win out over a desired future reality. To learn more, check out the Cash Dash Dash, a planning tool brought to you by The Guardian Network to see just how much your short-term spins might be impacting your longer-term financial goals. Play today by visiting www.livingconfidently.com slash play. Hello and welcome to Standard Deviations. I am your host, Dr. Daniel Crosby, and I am joined today by a fellow shrink, Dr. Joy Leary, who comes to us from California and is going to talk to us uh, about self-care in the age of coronavirus. Joy, how are you doing? I am doing fabulous, Daniel. Thank you. It's great to be hanging out with you today. Yes. Well, your episode ran last week and it was so well received. And we we recorded your episode, what, like, I don't know, six months ago or something? And in a time and place that seems so foreign from the place we find ourselves in today, I'm excited to have you back as the first repeat guest of Standard Deviation. So I hope you feel very special. I feel very honored and it is a privilege to be back with you today. Yes, that early fall morning feels like a lifetime ago. <laughs> yes. So I wanna I'm gonna ask you a question and, and get out of the way because my neighbors are like jackhammering or something. So this is uh, you know, uh on online life in the age of COVID-19. Yes. Uh, but you are a practicing uh, clinician. And I wanted to just start by talking to you about what, what you're seeing from your clientele. You know, there's obviously a lot of f- fallout from this psychologically, in addition to the sort of immediate health concerns of, of coronavirus. There's also, you know, economic, societal, and psychological fallout from this. And I, I just wanted to see what you're seeing and how it's impacting the folks you work with. Absolutely. So it's interesting. Often with psychotherapy, it is symptoms that will drive people into treatment or stir them to start to want to talk to somebody or decide that maybe they don't want to, but recognize maybe it's time for me to take a step. And to me, symptoms are signals that there are things that are off that are awry that need to be looked at and understood and addressed. So I wouldn't say overall that those things have changed dramatically. So obviously, people are talking a lot about just the widespread anxiety there is. There's a lot of panic. People are maybe contending more with some more depressive symptoms, sleep disturbance, a lot of struggles with eating, those kinds of things. But that that was happening before. The truth is everyone is just continuing to be a human just as we were 12 months ago. I think in some ways, some of the constrictions and constraints of quarantine and shelter in place have maybe dumped some accelerant on fire. I do think that there are, there are areas and for some people for whom COVID has created some of these issues for the very first time. So maybe there's somebody in their 50s who's like, I thought I just was having a heart attack last week. And it turns out I had the first panic attack I've ever experienced in my life. So I think there are those things. Um, When we look, I talk with people a lot about their relationships. So as people are at home, with their family, with their partners, with their kids, 
there are maybe a lot of things that were previously there that haven't been created, but have maybe been revealed that they're having to look at and understand and question a little bit more. There's, go I, ahead. I, I, I want to roll with this idea. You know, people, I, I hear this said of money a lot. Like, you know, ba basically money just makes you more of who you already were, right? And, uh, and mm -hmm. you're, I like this idea you've set forth of accelerant, right? So I look at, I look at my own symptoms. I don't want to totally just get free therapy here, but if I look at my own, you know, my own anxiety, <laughs> time, I, okay, who am I kidding? I do want free therapy. Now, if, if I look at the stuff that I've been dealing with, primarily sleep disorder stuff, I mean, yeah. that was, I've, I've had trouble with that for 20 years, but yes. I mean, it's much, it's much worse now. So do you yes. think that's true that sort of COVID, the, you know, sort of the low hum of anxiety around COVID just makes us more of who we already are? I think it, I think it really depends upon the person. So I'm someone who's, who doesn't believe that one thing applies to everybody because I do think I have seen for some people, the volume has gotten turned up, but I also have seen, and this as a clinician has been really exciting for me, there are people who have known for a long time, okay, anxiety is my Achilles heel, and they have done a lot of work on self-awareness and developing the skills and the practices that they need to manage that and function well in their life. So they're kind of like, wow, this is this is the marathon I've been training for, for a long time. And then they've been able to use what they have to respond to the crisis in a way that maybe people around them who are like, I, I have these anxious feelings. What do I do when I can't sleep? Maybe they don't have those resources or tools built yet. So I think it really depends. I, I read an article, and I'm, I apologize, I'm not going to remember what the news outlet was, but there was, an, there was an article about people who felt guilty for feeling, like, happy during this time, and it specifically mentioned people with anxiety, who I think, on the one hand, you know, if, if your whole life is preparing for, for disruption, then when the disruption comes, in, in some respects, you're kind of ready. And then yeah. I think some of their some of their fears were justified, and so it was talking about some of the people who sort of felt this paradoxical reaction to this, and and sort of paradoxically felt felt at ease by the state of the world being what it is now, which is fascinating. Yes, and I think there's there's another piece in there of what you just said that's important for everybody is it is okay to be okay. I think. A lot of people are finding themselves on this roller coaster they can't quite understand. And like the energy math, the emotional math doesn't make sense. Why do I feel like I can fire on at least six cylinders most some days and other days like I am exhausted, I am spent, I my head is spinning, I'm getting nothing done. And on those days when they're feeling okay and doing okay, it's okay to allow yourself to show up as you are in that space. So I think that's important. I think something else I've seen, and this is the nature of psychotherapy, is it's the deeper conversations. And I think what COVID has done is it has really stirred a lot of things on a deep level for people. So they are coming face to face with questions and possibilities about death, about for themselves, for loved ones. Um, I'm doing a lot of processing with people just about grief. Even if they haven't lost somebody, everybody, we are all in different ways dealing with intangible losses. It, a lot of people's expectations have really been obliterated and that has that creates a lot of feelings so there's a lot of work happening in that space i think what has come up around isolation and relationships and connectivity with people a lot of conversations are i'm having about that and also just this idea of what is let's step back and what is 
what is my meaning? What is my purpose? Do I want to keep doing things the way I was? I've been forced to start to do things differently. What do I really want to do in my life going forward? So those are those are the deeper conversations that that I love about what I get to do. But I think it's this this experience has really brought a lot of this to the fore for people that they hadn't had to look at before. So how do you think about this? Because on, on the one hand, I mean, I'm a big, you and I have talked on this show even about existential boundary experiences where it's like you have these moments of time when you're brought uh, to a greater awareness of your own finitude. And if this isn't one, then I don't know what is. Right. right. So in, in that respect, it's sort of a, a catalyst for, for thinking deeply about the self and, and making and personal improvements. But then, you know, I'm also sort of strongly of, of the idea that, you know, early in this whole crisis, there were all these these articles and think pieces about like Shakespeare, Shakespeare wrote whatever it was, you know, Shakespeare wrote one of his great works while in quarantine and like, what, what great art will come out of this? And I'm like, listen, Mm -hmm. man, I'm just trying to like, you know, put one foot in front of another and like make sure that my kids are fed and sane. So how, how do you think about this? Is this some great opportunity for personal growth? Is it just something to be gotten through or, or how do you think about it? I, I think it's maybe both. And I, I do believe that the, probably the salience of the emotional intensity of what people have experienced the last couple of months will fade. And that's why I'm really challenging people to really be honest with themselves and take stock right now. What have you learned and what can you commit to doing differently so that you can start? This is the time to be really ruthlessly auditing your life so that you can make, take steps to realign going forward when I, I, we aren't going back to anything. We are, we are moving forward, but really take ownership and authorship of what you want your life to look like going forward. Now, when you, I, I had this visceral reaction when you mentioned those articles, because the other thing I've seen, and I get really fired up about this, I did some writing about kind of keeping up with the pandemic Joneses. And I think this has been a very individual experience for some people. So I think a lot of people have found themselves at home and creating in their minds this idea, well, everyone else is doing this. And look at look at all these videos that are being produced on LinkedIn. And I should be doing this. And why am I not productive? And that person has started a fitness app. What? Somebody just posted on Twitter that they've this they've done great new healthy things and are making sourdough and have now started a course on how to make sourdough and they probably made six figures on that stupid course that you know people's heads could just spin and spiral and that the keeping up with the Joneses didn't serve us before. It's not serving us now and it's not going to serve us in the future. So I think really just bringing yourself back to today, what is important to me? What can I do? And how can I practice self-compassion with just showing up as I am, because part of this is getting through. And if you have the bandwidth and the drive to be doing and creating, yes, use this time and opportunity, but don't create that expectation or, or have this mindset that there is any should right now. There is not a should for existing as a human in a pandemic. That's a fantastic way to think about it. I saw, I saw a piece today that just talked about how this has impacted different, different groups of people so differently. I mean, for those 
for those in sort of the uh, middle class socio socioeconomically, um, many of them have been very hard hit. Many have, of course, lost their jobs. Uh, folks making minimum wage, folks making less than $40,000 a year, 40% have lost their jobs in the last six weeks. And then you've got people in the top five or 10% who are by and large unaffected by this and are making sourdough and starting fitness apps. And so, you know, the, 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 the variety of ways you can and should respond to this will be as varied as the people themselves. And so there is no should in a pandemic, I think is something great to remember. So I wanna talk about some of these specific manifestations uh, you know, in specific right now. First of all, something, again, this is partially free therapy because I really have been sleeping terribly, but I don't, I don't think I'm alone. And anecdotally, I'm yeah. hearing from, from, from people on Twitter, from friends and family, that not only people are sleeping more fitfully, but they're also having more vivid dreams and sleep disturbances. So what, what sense do you make of all this sleep disruption and the vivid dreams? So I think sleep disturbance is very common during times of stress, which is very unfortunate because when we are stressed out, that's when we need to be rested the most. And there is, sleep will mess with us when that is off i say to people like there and and i say this in all seriousness there is a reason why sleep is used as a sleep deprivation is used as a form of torture in war like this will rock you so as so a lot of people i work with have been talking about struggling with sleep and like many listeners of your podcast, I work with bright, intelligent people who they could probably tick back to me three sleep hygiene strategies that they probably Googled on their phone in the middle of the night while they were searching insomnia while lying in their bed. So I think getting sick and tired of being sick and tired is one. So really attend to those things. So being thoughtful about screen time caffeine, your alcohol use, those kinds of things, take care of that. But when I'm working with people in terms of maybe more intermediate steps, there are a few practical things I encourage them to think about. First of all, I really want people to pair their bed and their bedroom with sleep and sex only. So if you are not sleeping or getting it on with the person next to you it is best to not be laying there and spinning with your head saying i'm not sleeping i'm not sleeping so i encourage people to wait to go to bed until you are sleepy and if you are not falling asleep after say 10 or 15 minutes actually get up out of bed go to another place in your house that's comfortable, it can be a spare bedroom, it can be your sofa, and do something that you enjoy, but is not going to be completely overstimulating. So maybe that's doing a puzzle or reading something, even listening to a podcast. If, if it's going to help you, like clean out and organize a cupboard, do something, and then wait for your energy to get to a point where you're sleepy and then try again. And again, if after 10 or 15 minutes you are still not falling asleep, get up and do it again. Because what we don't want is for your body and your brain to link your bed and your bedroom with anything other than sleep. People also, when they struggle with sleep, they start to experience almost anxiety. I think most of us can remember a time where we were struggling to fall asleep and then we started to play the, oh, now I'm only going to get X number of hours. And then we look at the clock and then we start to get anxious about, now I'm only going to get this much sleep. And then we start... And the more anxious we are when we are lying there, that's not serving or helping us at all. So I really encourage people to replace, oh, I'm only going to sleep this number of hours, even if I fall asleep now, with a thought such as, 
my body's going to get the rest it needs tonight. We tend to, by and large, underestimate our ability to function on a limited amount of sleep, which then drives the anxiety, which gets in the way of our system kind of slowing down in a way that it needs to. Every parent in the universe can pull from their history times that they have been able to show up and function in their life quite well without the number of hours that they maybe optimally would have wanted. And I think the last thing I really encourage people, if you are struggling with sleep, I know just the sense of even what day is it is, has been turned inside out for a lot of people. However, as people maybe go back to a more traditional Monday through Friday schedule, look at what time you are going to bed and getting up in the morning. So it's really common for people on weekends to have different wake and waking up and going to bed times. But what you don't actually realize is that by doing that, you are creating a mini jet lag that your body then has to recover from all week. So if that is happening, that's not going to help your weekday sleep. So this is really fantastic. I think, like you said, many of us, myself included, could sort of tick off the, sort of the basics, you know, avoid the blue light. Uh, I personally try and make sure I get enough exercise during the day. That's a big help. I cut off caffeine consumption at, at noon. That's been a big help. But I like some of those intermediate steps. And one of the ones that I found most powerful is just that if you can't go to sleep in the first 15 minutes, get up and do something else because you really do get trapped in this death spiral of, like you said, you know, I'm only going to get five hours of sleep now and tomorrow's going to be brutal. And, you know, it's, it's not helpful. So just reorient, readjust. So uh, the, the next thing that I want to talk about, and I guess it's, you know, TBD here in the States, but China, China talked about the, the uptick in divorce rates so coming out of the shelter mm-hmm. in place order in Wuhan. Um, what impact are you seeing uh, coronavirus have on, on couples? And what sort of tips do you have for relationships maintaining, whether it's with kids, whether it's with your spouse or partner, how can we all stay friendly with these people we're locked in tight quarters with for so long? Yeah. Well, I think it goes back to what I said earlier. It, COVID hasn't created as much as it has probably revealed things that were maybe not outside of people's awareness. So people are forced to spend more time to together slash get to spend more time together, having more time and space for conversation. So I think people have, throughout, throughout this, they've learned a lot about themselves and about their relationships. And something I go back to, I know boundaries is a big buzzword right now, but it, they really, there's a, there's a reason for that. My I really encourage people in their relationships, in their homes, to be thinking about boundaries in terms of time, in terms of space. And I know that's challenging, but when presented with a challenge, that just means getting creative and also in your relationships. So a lot of boundaries have been blurred right now. So really looking at how can you differentiate and kind of set a schedule how can you how can you create transition times in and out of work how can you communicate expectations clearly i also think it's really important particularly for people who are wired just to need more solitude time to have more energy to create spaces where you are sufficiently getting alone time. So maybe that's making sure and communicating you're going out, you're going for a walk, those kinds of things. Um, because altogether all the time is, is not the best thing for anyone. 
I think one of the things that has kept my wife and I sane throughout this is, is walks, like giving each other time. Like you, we, we typically in the course of any given day, I, I will go on a walk. She will go on a walk solo. And then we will go on a family walk. And yes, so, you know, you're, you're getting the exercise, but you're also getting the alone time. You're getting time to listen to a podcast or connect with some, you know, call your parents or connect with someone and it's really powerful. And I think it needs to be couched in terms of, you know, this isn't me escaping you, right? Like this is just, no. this isn't, uh, you know, this isn't anything negative. I'm not sick of you or anything like that. This is just, you know, look, everybody needs alone time. Everyone needs reflection time. Nobody's getting it right now. So I think yes. setting those boundaries and those expectations in a sort of non-judgmental and even positive way has been, has been our, our saving grace so far. Uh, one of the things you talked about early on was that sleep disturbance had been used as a form of punishment. Uh, I want to talk about another form of punishment here, which is isolation. So, you know, I'm getting a lot of call from advisors lately to talk about the impact of, of isolation on well-being, because some of the advisors with whom I work are finding that their clients just feel very lonely or very isolated. I knew this was a big problem, but, but having dug into it a little bit <clears throat> more recently, I, I just wanted to share some of what I found and then we can have a conversation about it. So first of all, I, I found that Great Britain and Japan pre-COVID had actually appointed ministers of loneliness because loneliness had become so epidemic uh, in, in these countries. So actual government position, a minister of loneliness. Uh, a study of Americans, again, pre-COVID, 20,000 Americans surveyed, half of them said they were lonely or very lonely every day, right? And when we look at the health impacts of, uh, of loneliness, a study out from my alma mater found that the health impacts of loneliness and so social isolation were twice as damaging as obesity and were equivalent to smoking 15 cigarettes a day. Mm. So like we think about something like loneliness, which I think a lot of us are feeling right now, and, and many of us are sort of cut off from our social support systems. What are we to do at a time when, you know, some of the best medical advice is that you need to keep distance from people when we know that we know that connection and social connection and togetherness does so much good for us psychologically? I think we really need to remember that relationships are not strictly contingent and built on physical proximity. You know, I, I think back to the before, and I, w I have this picture in my mind of a group of people in a restaurant. Yeah, they're together, and they're all looking at their phones. Like, what was the depth? of the connection and relate in question and conversation that was happening before, because that is what real relationships are built on. Real relationships are built on communication, not face-to-face -face minutes. And one thing I have seen that I'm really excited about is people are starting to ask better and different and deeper questions actually wanting answers and people are starting to make some steps forward to start giving more real answers you know it's kind of the going through the checkout at the grocery store how are you today well do you want the real answer or am i going to give you the quick polite one the fact that there's kind of People are joking about, okay, enough, how are you doing? The fact that we've started to do that, I think is really important. And maybe this, I have confidence that even when we are physically separated, we can still have very deep, meaningful relationships with people. And I know that comes from my drawing on my own experience as a military spouse who's moved around a lot, the people I'm closest to in my life are not necessarily the ones that I am in the closest geographic proximity to. So 
I think relationships require, they require skills like learning. Okay. How do I ask these deeper questions? And it requires self-awareness and practice in being more vulnerable and real and authentic with people. But I, I actually think that we don't have, this doesn't need to be a time of social isolation if we choose something different. So I, I love what you said uh, about just giving honest answers. And I, it'll be fascinating to see how we societally are changed by this. I hope we, right alongside you that one of the things that we uh, change as a society is this tendency to operate with this sort of dance of superficiality at this thin veneer of, 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 you know, social niceties. Yes. Yeah. Like I hope we can get a little bit more honest because, you know, one of the things that my brief time as a, as a therapist taught me was just sort of a great impatience with superficiality. Like I feel yes. like I should be able to meet someone at a party and like, you know, ask them, Hey, nice to meet you. What are your deepest fears? Right. <laughs> because uh, being a therapist, you just always cut to the chase. And in society, we don't, we don't always get that deep. And I think it's to our detriment. Yes. And I think, and this is something I will speak to you again from personal experience. When I, the nature of my husband's work, knowing that I may have a finite period of time someplace, I have a choice. And I observe people tipping one way or another with this within my communities it's some people decide okay if i know this is going to be finite i i'm going to choose to not invest and just kind of close in and play it safe and whereas i tend to approach it as okay i i have an opportunity but if i'm going to go i need to go all in and go in maybe a little bit more accelerated. Now that is, please do not confuse that with to anyone listening with this to being like boundaryless with what you share right away with someone you don't know, like be thoughtful about that. But there's something about saying, okay, I'm, I'm going to go all in. Otherwise I might miss out on an incredibly rich, meaningful connection. And I will say, that has never, I've never regretted that. And it, relationally, professionally, any of those things. So um, yeah, that was, that was one place my mind went as I was listening to you. Yeah, there's the, the old saying that everyone's fighting a hard battle that you know nothing of. And you know, part of the reason why we know nothing of these battles is because we're loath to, to share them with each other. Uh, and yet we know that the best relationships are built on vulnerability and mutual honesty. And so, yes. yeah, it's a fine line to walk between oversharing and TMI. But uh, I think that this whole thing has given us permission when, when someone asks how we're doing to say like, yeah, but I'm pretty tired, right? <laughs> like, I'm, yes. pretty, I'm a little freaked out. Like, this is weird. I'm tired. This is hard. Yeah. Uh, and I hope that we can we can keep that in, a, in an appropriate dose. So you, you recently wrote a blog post titled self-care is more than a manicure, which was just to me like chef's kiss. Brilliant. I love that title. And I thought, <laughs> I, I thought that it brilliantly touched on how we sort of misperceive the concept of, of self-care as like a, a spa day. Right. Like self-care is just murdering yourself at work you know, uh, all, all the time and then occasionally going out and, you know, treating yourself. But it's, it's really more than that. So can you speak to what real self-care looks like and how we sort of culturally misperceive it? Absolutely. This is a soap, not a soapbox for me. This is like a soap building that I get really fired up about. So self-care was not a manicure even before all the salons closed a few months ago. So to me, self-care is more about self-preservation. And it is what allows us to perform at our peak. So it is a collection of micro and macro decisions that we make consistently that allow us to really optimize our performance 
and functioning in all of the roles we step into in our life. And it's not something, it is not a luxury, it, and it's not an indulgence. It's really taking care of yourself so that you can be the best to the people you are serving, to the people you love, and for your own health. And it's not something to be fit in or squeezed in here and there when you can make time. If you do that, it's going to get squeezed out. So for me, I really believe self-care has to be regular, consistent practices. And it's, it's bigger things and it's tiny little things. So it's being willing to say no to somebody when they are inviting you someplace that you don't have time or energy to go and not committing to something because you want to please somebody. It is setting your keys in the same place each night so you aren't setting yourself up in the morning to be leaving the house stressed out of your mind and being late. It's flossing your teeth. It's going, getting physical movement consistently and not saying, well, I'll see if I can fit it in somewhere. No, it's putting that on your calendar so that the people in your office know this is what I do at this time and not playing the game of, well, maybe I should be with my kids at this time. No, you're going to show up in your life better and healthier if you are doing these things consistently. And it's also bigger thing. You know, there's a lot of buzz and talk about burnout and it's like, well, take better care of yourself. Well, it's, we can't keep going, jumping back into the same fire and hoping that a quick fix like a manicure is going to solve that. So no, maybe self-care is stepping back and making bigger decisions about, about your schedule, even about your career. I, I do a lot of talking with people about their salary and contract negotiations. Self-care is going into an experience like that confidently, unapologetically. It's asking for more. It's, all, it's a collection of all of these things. So it has nothing to do with nail polish, people. Well, I like it. you said it more eloquently than I will restate it here, but I like how you said at the outset that it's really about maximizing performance because yes. I, I think as it's commonly conceptualized, it's like, oh, it's like a, it's a distraction from maximal performance. You're going to be, you know, crushing it for, for some period of time. You're going to fall to pieces. You're going to have a spa day and then we're going to patch you back together. But I think it's the... Uh, you, the thing you're talking about is much more holistic, it's much more integrated, and it has at its heart a desire to always be at your best across many facets of your life uh, and not to, not to need to fall apart necessarily. Yes. So one of, one of the most common concerns that I ran into back when I was a therapist is, you know, someone would come to me and they would say, you know, they would, they would tearfully tell me their story of whatever it was, had brought them into therapy. It was a breakup or, you know, some sort of other problem that had brought them to therapy. I was working with college students primarily, so lots of breakups. Mm -hmm. but they, would tell, they would tell me this and they would immediately begin to backpedal. But they would say, well, but, you know, what right do I have to be depressed? What right do I have to be sad? Because, you know, there's whatever. There's, there's kids starving in the world and uh, here I am, you know, upper middle class me whining about getting dumped and what right do I have? And so, you know, as I, as I talk with you about self-care here, we're sitting here at a week when at this point, nearly 40 million Americans have lost their jobs. Mm -hmm. You know, a hundred thousand people have passed away. Like, I mean, this thing is just both from a health perspective and economically, it is, it is holistically catastrophic. And yes. so it can feel a little self-indulgent for someone like me who is, you know, sitting in his suburban home with a, with a job and with healthy, you know, healthy kids to say, yeah, hey, I need some self-care when, when all of this is falling apart around me. So how do we kind of give ourselves permission and, and 
how do we sort of rebut this idea that self-care is indulgent if we ourselves are, are doing okay? So I'm going to push back on you a little bit because that's part of what I do. Because I think even the reframing of that is part of what is problematic. It, it speaks to this idea of comparative suffering. And yes, there are times when we are spiraling and spinning down where it's really useful to, to think about, have a perspective shift of, okay, this could be different, this could be bigger, this could be harder in a different way. But going to this space within ourselves of invalidating our own experience and our suffering is never going to serve us. Right now, more than ever, what this world needs is everyone showing up as they are with the resources they have to the best of their ability and contributing that what they can uniquely give to the collective. One of my one of my very favorite movies is It's a Wonderful Life. And I'm like, like I just got emotional even saying that. And like there's something so powerful about this story because none of us know what the raindrops we make in an ocean and right now there is an ocean of need but the ripple effect of how we show up and how we choose to use the the voice and what is uniquely ours to give to another person the ripple effect of what that creates a real belief for people is a tsunami effect that we'll never know see or understand in the ocean so I take even someone like you, who you can sit there and say, well, oh, I'm sitting here and I'm watching Netflix and I, I'm able to do all of these things. But if you stop and step back and look at, well, what is, what is the impact of the ripple impact? impact of the conversation I have with this advisor and this advisor who are then taking what I have learned and what I can give them to their clients who are who are frightened, who are vulnerable. Like the ripple effect of all of us actually helping us, helping one another be healthier is part of what is going to help us move through. And in order for each of us to come forward, to step up and step forward with what we have to the best of our ability, it goes back to this optimizing performance and functioning. So the very best thing any of us can do right now is be taking steps to be our healthiest selves. Because the ripple effect what we are bringing is going to trickle down. So I love this idea and we're going to, we'll, we'll even end with it. I love this question of what is it that I, that I bring to this fight, right? This fight against COVID-19, you know, we see, uh, <clears throat> we see all the frontline healthcare workers. We see the scientists racing for a vaccine. We see the delivery people and the folks that work at a grocery store and like all these people who are helping fight against this, all of these people who are helping life, uh, you know, some semblance of a normal life move forward. And they are obviously and materially contributing to this. But I think that it's easy for us, maybe if, if you know, if we don't wear scrubs or we don't work in a lab, it's easy for us to think that we don't have anything to contribute and I don't think that that's the case. And I love this concept of what is the unique contribution that I can make to this, to this time, the singular time in human history? What can I contribute? Uh, and I think for, for each of us, it's, it's something. Exactly. And I don't know when this is going to air. I know we are approaching Memorial Day, but when, when you know, there's been this, this parallel and metaphor drawn of the fight against COVID kind of being like a war and the physicians on the front lines, things like that. And my mind goes to when my husband was getting lit up by the Taliban in a valley in Afghanistan, 
I think we didn't need everyone out there right next to him with a machine gun. We needed people making body armor and I needed somebody who could like help me with, with my car when I was home. So there are, there are all ways that we can be supporting and serving. And again, there's an ocean of need. So I, I talk with my clients and I really think about this. I can be overwhelmed by an empty ocean or I can ask myself, what are the raindrops that I can create in my world with the people in my circle just today? And that can be small, but I think sometimes the small, simple things we do have some of the most profound impact that people will never forget. Beautiful. Well, you have, uh, you have uh, transformed our family dinner conversation tonight. This is going to be the topic of conversation. What can I and what can we uh, contribute to this? And I love the example you gave of your husband uh, and his very literal fight and how we, we still needed people contributing in other ways. So, Joy, I recently sent out a tweet that I meant from the bottom of my heart that you are one of the sharpest voices in psychology right now. You are doing such innovative stuff, and I, I wanted to point everyone to, to your work and to your site. You have been a content beast throughout this. You've been writing so much great stuff. It's been very timely to help people get through this. If people want to learn more about you and your work and to, to read your writing and to see your videos, please let everyone know where they can check, check out your work. Well, that's very kind of you. My website and my blog is my, just my name, so J-O-Y-L-E-R-E. -E. And writing for me has been a form of oxygen through this. It's how, as a human, I have processed a lot. Um, and I just love written words. I also can be found, I love LinkedIn. So I have some things that I've been putting out on there. I've also joined the party slash raid slash slash firestorm. That is Twitter. I'm happy to hang out with you on there. And sometimes I spin my creative wheels on Instagram from time to time. What's your, give them your Twitter handle. So my Twitter and Instagram handle is um, at, and my name, J-O-Y-L-E-R-E, -E, and then my degree, P-S-Y-D. Okay, beautiful. Yes, if you're not already following Dr. Joy on LinkedIn and, and Twitter, she really does put out a ton of great content, great writing, great videos please tune in there. She is the, the right person for these times. She is a person who is singularly called to be uh, spreading positive messages at a time when, when we are in sore need of those. So Dr. Joy, thank you again for being the first ever repeat guest. It was, uh, it was a pleasure and I know my listeners are gonna get a ton of good out of this, so thank you. Thank you so much, Daniel. All opinions expressed by Dr. Daniel Crosby and podcast guests are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinion of or endorsement by the Guardian Life Insurance Company of America, Guardian, and its affiliates, subsidiaries, employees, and agents, including Park Avenue Securities and the Guardian Network. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for legal, tax, and investment decisions. The opinions are based upon information participants consider reliable, and Dr. Crosby and Guardian are not responsible for the consequences of any decisions or actions taken because of the information provided. Guardian copyright is a registered trademark of the Guardian Life Insurance Company of America. All materials are subject to United States copyright laws. Copyright 2020 Guardian 2020-104638, expiration 07-22.